So we are about to start uh, Vivek Chuda Mani, this text that we are studying, Google group. So the information will be sent out in the Samvad to join so that you can have a PDF of the text available to you and my student from India, Shivani, will be working with me uh, in helping facilitate that group. So you can be active, you can ask questions, you can contribute comments because a text like a text, a yes. grantha has to be not only heard but we have to do mananam, reflection and uh, the Google group will help with that reflection and then finally it has to be practiced. So that practice is still up to us whether we do it or not. So hopefully we can make a sadhana out of the satsanga that we are having. Those of you who are not part of Vedika, you should let Divya know your email. Divya? She's Divya. So that you are invited to the Google group. <coughs> if you want to go. It's not compulsory. <coughs> Can you spell, spell Viveka Churana? Yeah. What does Viveka mean? Do you know? Wisdom. Huh? Wisdom. wisdom. Not wisdom. Huh? Vivek literally means the power of discrimination. Buddhi everybody has, but the one who has a discriminating buddhi is called Viveka buddhi. Mm. So, Chura Mani. Chura means hair. And Mani means gem. So, Vivek is such a gem that we will not put at our feet, but we will decorate on our head. Are you following? So, it is the crest jewel of discrimination. That is the literal meaning of Vivek Churamani. Thank you, baby. So, I had written in my notice of passing that how we are Amritasya Putra, we are the children of immortality, say the Upanishads. Hence, what does this mean? This means that we have both the mortal parts as well as the immortal parts within this being. And we as human beings have the unique opportunity to potentially be able to discriminate between the mortal and the immortal. And because immortality, or which is called, known as Amrit Tattvam or the Amrit, is the uniqueness of the soul, self and God. So once we are able to connect with this immortal part of us, we are able to become anchored in God reality. Because until we do not know that immortal part, and we are only identified with the mortal parts, which, which our senses can see as <coughs> in the body, and this is it, then we remain limited by that body. So the whole goal of Viveka Chuda Mani is discrimination and this discrimination is specifically between the mortal parts or the immortal essence of our being, the self or the jiva, what is known as the Atman or the Anatman, non-self. The whole text which has 500 plus shlokas takes us systematically through 
all the arguments, obstacles, difficulties, self-deceptions, illusions, limitations of an average human mind, which come in the way of our recognition of our immortal essence. So, if a seeker was determined that I want to live on earth, be in this body, be in this world, fulfill my material goals and at the same time, in this lifetime, be fully cognizant of, realize and be anchored in and operate from my immortal Atman essence, which is who I am, but yet it is veiled from me because my ordinary senses and my ordinary mind cannot touch it, identify it. But that doesn't mean it does not exist. So this knowledge can only be gained through the teachings of the Siddhanta or the principles of Vedanta and this book Vivek Churamani is dedicated to this effort. By connecting with our immortal essence we do not become some spiritual freaks or, uh, uh, um, unwor or uh, separate from the masses or we have to lead a life which is remarkably different. We can continue to be mothers, entrepreneurs, leaders, presidents, teachers, husbands, lovers, parents, but we will be operating from a very changed perspective due to a quantitatively qualitatively and quantumly shifted paradigm. We are all creatures. There is no doubt that human beings are biological creatures. And due to our creaturehood, we come packaged with two kinds of situations. One is that we share in common with all creatures, be it a little earthworm, be it a bird, be it even the tiger in the forest. We come packaged with fear. That fear changes its face. Biological fear. My survival. Social fear. My position. Spiritual fear. My existence. Fear. This is in built-in creatures. The simple creatures with one or two sense organs have more biological fear. Slightly advanced creatures like even dogs and elephants start having social fear. <coughs> Are you aware of this? If you have seen animals who live in packs, the animal that is outside his pack is suffering from social fear and will crouch and put the tail between the legs to compensate for this fear as we do at times. So one is because of our creaturehood we have fear and the second thing we have is dependence. Fear makes us dependent dependent on this material world of objects and relationships. 
relational objects and material objects. We cannot identify our life without them. Who am I without my relationships? I do not know. I don't want to know. I have fear. So, dependence generates fear. Fear generates dependence. And in the end, we lose our freedom. Do you realize that? There is no freedom. We may be the king of a country, the president of a country, <coughs> the head of an organization, but until such time, I am free of fear and free of dependence. Until I have become abhaya or fearless, and until I have become mukta or independent, until such time, I am not truly enjoying my power. I may be the first lady, but it has no meaning. The first lady's head is very heavy, very worried. You understand? I may be the first family, and many countries are first family. I'm not talking only about America, but it has no meaning. So Vedanta says, Vedanta is a science which raises a very personal question. It says, let us try to examine this fear and this dependence. And let us try to evoke within ourselves another kind of thirst. And this is the thirst of freedom. We look around and we find people not free. But occasionally a master comes, a teacher comes, an avatar comes, a sage comes. Or a book, a grantha like Vivek Chudamani, we study, which reminds us that we are ultimately all seeking freedom. We are seeking freedom of choice, freedom to love, freedom to, you know, be healthy. We want freedom, do we not? So, there are four kinds of jivas. The first kind is called Baddha Jiva. B A D H A. Baddha. Dha ko kaise likte B A D H A. Baddha Jiva. Baddha means bound. The second kind is called Mumukshu. Mumukshu means struggling. The third is called Mukta. The fourth is called Nitya Mukta. Eternally free. Mukta means free. And the fourth one is Nitya Mukta. Eternally free. So when we cast a net to catch fish. Do you cast a net to catch fish? Back in the old days, could you submerge a net to catch the fish? I am giving you an example. The Baddhas are like Jeevas who are bound and they don't even question that they are bound. They may complain about the situations, but they do not, come, they do not question the binding itself. They are quite satisfied with this life, with lack of power. They think power is in becoming the president of this organization, the chairperson of that, and, um, you know, I get to call the shot as to which house we buy, which property. That's power. That's not power. You, you take on that kind of power and your head becomes more bound. Does it not? That's not power. So, but the jivas are people who are trapped. So, these are the fishes who are trapped... They are okay with it. If you tell them, come, there is a free class on Vedanta, they may not actually appreciate it. They, if they are sitting here, they will throw a few rotten eggs on me. 
What is it? You're boring us. Can we have a movie night? Now that we are here. Means they may not know what is the problem. They may just say like, he said that, she did this and I did that and then they dab, 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 dab. <laughs> so if you say to them, come, you want power, I want power. Come, I will show you. Power is in renouncing. What are you saying? So it's a very, very difficult concept. So they are baddha jivas. They are bound jivas. So Vedanta doesn't address them. And unfortunately, if one of you is my student, I have great sympathy for you. I don't know how you suffer people like me. Means it's like, why you are here? But chances are, fact you are here, you are not that. Are you understanding? So most probably, all of you are the next category. You are all struggling. Jema? Jema. If you are here, you are, so two of you are not even current students, but you are here. Why? Because you are struggling. This is the best category according to Vedanta. Mumukshu. Can you say that? Mumukshu. Mumukshu. I, the one who wants moksha is called Mumukshu. Means they are struggling. They are struggling against their own lower nature. These are the fish that are trying to bite the net. These are the fish who are saying, okay, uh, uh, go to that big fish. That big fish will teach you how to bite the net. <laughs> These are the fish who are saying, okay, if we all bite together, the net will go. These are the fish who are saying, if I control my breathing and then I open my eyes, the net is not there. <laughs> we are all struggling. And uh, you don't have to be Hindu to be Mumukshu. Mumukshu is not a religious state of mind. Mumukshu is a state of consciousness where this is not about struggle from my husband, struggle with the government. This is struggle with the limitations of the fact that I have no choice over my birth and no choice over my death and not even much choice over very big large sections of my life. Next moment what will happen I do not know yet I am forced to walk through this life with my head held high. What is all this? This is, the, I didn't sign up for it. If I signed up for it, please show me the contract. Who did I sign it to? I want to know the whole truth. If it takes one million chanting of Gayatri, I'll do it. But at the end of it, I want to know the deal. And in fact, I want, if, I don't want to read books which say, you made a choice. Remind me, show me, where, <laughs> how, when. Mumukshu. I am struggling to know my immortal essence. I am no longer willing. I will make the best of my mortal cage and body and I will treat it royally with Ayurved and I will uh, treat my mind and senses royally with Yoga Ayurved. But I will now apply Vedanta until I know. So these fish are struggling. We are all mumukshu. The mumukshu will not just cry over spilled milk, but will question the obligation to cry over spilled milk. Is the milk really spilled? Do I really have to cry? Etc. etc. This is mumukshu. The third kind of jiva, means jiva means still living, is mukta. Means it is jiva as in it is in the body and mind, yet it has become free. Means using Vedanta, realizing Vedanta, using Vedanta knowledge of the knowledge of the shlokas, memorized shlokas, didactic lecturing of the shlokas, very easy. But living that knowledge, one suddenly has, this is given in the Siddhanta, that as one reflects and practices what we will learn here, one suddenly has anubhava or realization or self-experience of another reality which is coexisting but we are away from it. 
that larger dimension of the self gets revealed to us. That is a mukta. So who is this mukta? These are fish who were mumukshu earlier. They were biting away, they got away from the net. This is mukta. So sometimes there will be some teacher who will be uh, like me and I am a mumukshu and I will try very hard and perhaps if I am sincere, every mumukshu will become a mukta. Means I can always call myself, you know, Shunya Pratichi Mathur Mukta. It has no meaning. I must really experience it. You understand? But wherever we are free, where are we free? Where we don't have fear and where we don't have dependence. There we become relatively more mukta. Do you understand? We are operating from a more free paradigm than a bound paradigm. But mukta is not just a little bit free. Mukta is full time free. Fully free. Now this is great. This person has changed the paradigm. And nitya mukta is that fish which lives in the ocean but it will never get caught in the net to begin. So when the mukta returns, it doesn't return like Ramana Maharishi to get caught in the net. It remains in the ocean but always remains out of the net telling the other mumukshus how to bite the net. Like Shankara. Shankara who wrote, who, uh, who wrote this Adi Shankara who wrote this uh, trustees Vivek Churamani lived only for you know how many years? Do you know at what age he left us? 32. And in 32, he wrote so many texts and the most authoritative commentaries on all Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Sutras, and um, uh, the, the most authoritative text for Bhakti Yoga, Bhajagovinda, the most authoritative text for Gnana Yoga, Vivek Churamani, and at 32, singing some hymn, he left and he disappeared. He didn't even die. He finished, left his body in the Himalayas. So, these people just come and he was alive in um, 788 to 820 AD. And how many years have passed now? Some... About those 2,000 years. And still people are benefiting from one one shloka of these people, these Nitya Muktas. And they are benefiting. So these are not ordinary. So our goal is that if we are Baddha Jeevas, Bound Jeevas, we want to become, we want to understand this bondage and not give up to it. We think bondage is bondage to the bad mother-in-law, bondage to um, poverty. No, no. By accepting the so-called bad mother-in-law, we actually become more free. Do you understand? Then accepting that there is no bad or good, the mother-in-law, then the soul, it's, it's a deeper process. It's not about, you know, I am not going to, I am going to struggle. I am not talking about the external struggle. I am talking about the internal struggle with our own lower rajas tamas nature. That is a person who is bound because they are bound to experience their own agitation. They are bound to experience their own shame, bound to experience their own anger, bound to experience their own restlessness, bound to reap whatever they have sown. And if I have sown Scorpios, I will be bitten by them. So I am bound. I am bound. And this, and, and I am bound the very fact that I am alive, I am bound. 
I am bound. I am bound uh, that I have no choice over which womb I get. I am bound that I get the parents I get. I am bound by when they die, when they live. How they, whether they abandon, whether they love too much, whether they don't love. I am bound by the government of my country, which I have no choice. I am bound, I am bound, I am bound. And then we talk about, I need my space. Mm -hmm. I need my freedom. And I will argue about it. And I will bang my head. But in everything, I am bound. And Vedanta says, you are Amrutasya Putra. You are children of immortality. Awaken and stop banging your mortal head. Mm -hmm. You can break your brain and hurt yourself and get a concussion. That's all you will do. But what you have to do is look at this bondage and see if that is what you need. And therefore, Mumukshatvam or Mumukshu is the best state of sadhana where I am struggling with what? With my own conditioned default rajastamas nature which is the product of whatever I have evolved till now. And that is why we are understanding why Narajanama Durlabhmataha well, given that I am bound, I mean, Sarah and I are sure glad that we are humans. I mean, did we have a choice? You and I could have been any other animal on the world or a plant on my kitchen window, right? I mean, what do we know? So it's like a grace. I mean, it's a unique opportunity because only in the human being, consciousness, sense organs and mind and limbs have evolved to the point where this... Leela or this game of life can come to a place where a creature can say, okay, I am ready to step out of my creaturehood and back into reclaiming my authorhood, godhood, selfhood, supremehood, divinehood. And we have noticed in the living era of our living memory of many people who are very different from being creature-like humans to being God-like humans. Free humans. Amazing humans. Unbound humans. So these become our role models. But Vivek Chudamani says very clearly that it is not enough to just be born human, first verse. It is not enough to be uh, having a somewhat of a uh, masculine temperament. And we talked about masculine and feminine here. This comes from those of you who are senior students here. You studied Purusha Prakriti, right? So Prakriti is a feminine, changeable principle. Purusha is a more, um, is an unchanging, immutable principle. So here when we talk about masculine temperament, here we mean a more detached, less moody, less emotional, uh, less changeable temperament. So then we talk about the life of a Vipra, which means Brahman, which means one who is willing to walk the path of sattva. So it is not only a masculine attitude, but then also that attitude has a preponderance of or an affinity for or a conscious cultivation of sattva. For example, uh, I will get up in the morning is a rational, logical, non-emotional decision. I will get up every morning and take a shower and then I will light a lamp, then I will cook fresh food, then I will try not to gossip on the phone, then I will X, Y, Z, all sattvic choices. Sattva, sattva, sattva. And then it is not enough just to be sattva, 
because we can get filled up with like uh, some ego of being good you know goody two shoes kind of person so <coughs> we need also vedic marg dharma parata which means the vedas lay out two things vedics ha veda has karma kand and gnana kand karma kand means vedas are also showing us rituals like yagna etc fire ceremonies then vedas have gnan or they talk about dharma dharma is an impersonal universal consciousness that underlies right actions right thought right speech and takes us towards the immortal truth so very carefully in this in this first shloka second shloka shankara doesn't say you have sattva and then every morning you get up and do fire ceremonies you can do all the fire ceremonies you want in fact there is a shloka coming saying go away chant away as much as you want do as many fire ceremonies as you want you are still very far away from the truth dharma on the other hand is a dharma of humanitarianism of spiritual evolution of that perfect thought after discrimination arrived upon perfect speech perfect action that will lead us closer and closer to the atman versus the non self that is the veda dharma so you have to study it like this vivek chudamani is also a knowledge from this path so it is a systematic path it is not a random path one person who occasionally writes to me because many people write to me whether they are my students or not many people write to me so occasionally when she is full of angst she will write to me so she wrote to me uh, something something some difficulties so so much ignorance so i said it is better you become my student for one year or you please come online now satsang is also open you just systematically learn so the response was i already feel i know the vedas just answer me this question so i said to her if you knew the vedas i would be writing to you for the answer of my question but you are not giving me that privilege and if you are writing to me every 15 days then there you should be curious i was scientifically trying to make her understand what is it that i know that you don't know and even it's not about my mastery it is about there is something that you are walking away with from me and what is that it has nothing to do with me as a creature it has to do with systematic grounding in a certain science of the immortal essence of the atman it is a science just to study vat pitt kaf oh i did my quiz do you know ayurveda many people say oh i know ayurveda oh i do ayurveda how do you do it i take trifla every night right abhi ji this is a very common answer oh you are an ayurveda doctor oh i also do ayurveda I drink trifla every night. Hey, Ayurveda is an ocean, and that ocean cannot you cannot dive in the middle. You have to start at the beach first. You have to worship it. First, you have to call Dhanvantri. Then you have to understand basic principles. Then slowly, slowly, you have to understand basic principles. Then physiology, health, healthy physiology. Then you have to understand pathology, Vikruti, Vignan. then you have to understand roga vignan why disease happened then you have to understand chikitsa therapy then you have to understand specialized chikitsa it's not like, oh i know ayurveda it has no meaning similarly to say oh i know the vedas but you might know asatoma sadgamaya you can say it 
or I, I have you have some general idea about God, spirit, this, that, but it is not knowing the Vedas. So Vedic Dharma Marg Parata means a Mumukshu has to not only have a masculine attitude, means less moody, less emotional, more rational, more, you know, more middle of the way attitude, then we have to cultivate sattva and then we have to do scholarly, systematic training and understanding of a path. And this path is an art. And it's an art and a skilled science of self-mastery. What is self? The mastery of the lower self by the higher self. And then Anubhava. It is not enough to say, I, I, how many Vedas do you know? Oh, I know two Vedas, you know, Rig and Sam. I'm an expert. My whole family, seven generations, the Vedi, we have studied two Vedas. Or we are three Vedis, very famous, we have studied three Vedas. No meaning. It has no meaning. I know them. I can recite them backwards. I can recite them in the uh, these different ways, meters. Have you experienced what these books are saying? Otherwise, they could be actually just a bunch of belief systems forced upon you. Until you have verified them through your personal experience. So this Anubhava, uh, the, the Shankara says, he gives the description of a true full moon and your experience with the full moon and then somebody brings a painting of the moon. Will you have the same experience? So Shankara says that we have to go towards Anubhava. But that Anubhava, how can we have? Without a very critical step, which we don't want. We want to come to class or we want to go to a library. We want to buy a very expensive books. We want to have a personal you know, bookcase of our spiritual books. But then we want to have an experience. And we even sometimes go to our teacher and say, when will I have this experience? In fact, some teachers have become so clever, they say, if you pay donation, I will put my hand on you and I will give you, I will hold it like this. <laughs> that will be your experience. <coughs> no, really. Or I will tap you and then something will go up and down in you. Anyway, tapping will create all that. And then create so many sounds around you. And I'll ask you to meditate. Then you'll fall asleep and you'll wake up. And then we'll give you some good food. That's it. That's your experience. Anubhava. So what is it? Teacher is also having a good time. Student is also having a good time. After all, I've read the book. So now I should have experience. But Shankara says there is no experience for the one who doesn't go home and do the homework every minute of viveka, discrimination between reality and non-reality, Atman and Jiva, important and trivial, past and now, illusion and what is actual, projection and possibility. <coughs> in every moment. In every moment. So this is called Atma, Anatma, Vivechan. Atma, Self, Anatma, Non-Self. Every minute, even when you are having pain, and we often say, I am having pain. Mm -hmm. We may say it, but we should know the body I live in is a little blocked. Let me apply this whatever X, Y, Z and see what happened. This is, uh, this body is not me. I dwell in it. This mind, this is my equipment. It is a little, got too many buttons got triggered on. I think I better put it to bed. I think I better 
फीड दिस बॉडी दिस फूड सो आत्मा अनात्मा विवेचना डिस्क्रिमिनेशन कॉन्स्टेंट सो विदाउट वाइल डूइंग दिस ओनली स्लोली स्लोली द ट्रिवियल द नॉइज द एक्सेसिव वृत्तीज दे विल बिगिन टू क्लाउड अस लेस gradually in that clarified akasha chitta akasha internal chitta space the anubhava or the experience of the self will occur just like a diamond is found by a dime by a gemologist and a fisherman the fisherman doesn't know the value of the gem and thinks it's a pretty rock and puts it in his house for his child to play but the gemologist finds the gem and actually knows its value so the gemologist has gone through some training and has looked at various artificial diamonds to ultimately know the value of the true diamond are you following and is constantly evaluating what is the look alike and what is real and any self indulgence at this point why because we had we didn't have the right calm attitude satva so just having good thoughts is not enough because those good thoughts in a minute can turn into bad thoughts that is why we need constant systematic and a training of the mind by the vedic marga vedic path vedic knowledge ayurveda is part of that vedic knowledge so just like you cannot uh, become an ayurveda you cannot use ayurved by reading one article one needs to work either with a vaidya for many months and years or actually become well versed in it in the same way for body ayurved for mind yoga and for the soul vedanta we need a committed path and that path only this gurukul is teaching currently in conjugation why this was the way to teach all the scholars but uh, it was not recognized that the vaidya to be able to receive this beautiful vidyas needs to have a pure vessel but if a vaidya is more free do you think this vaidya's presence in front of the suffering one will release the suffering what do you think but if the vaidya is feeling bound by the profession irritated by the commute uh, troubled by the lack of inability to pay by the preferred mode of cash payment versus check everything is irritating the practitioner bound and bound then how much freedom will this vaidya gift the suffering one because the one who has become physically diseased mentally diseased spiritually diseased has collapsed into being bound mm -hmm. and if you are met by another bound healer do you really think and i am making this personal statement here do you really think healing can take place when we are able to heal we are able to heal even when we are able to heal in the allopathic model we are relatively free from the one who is suffering that is why we are told to not get start crying with the suffering one that is why the first thing and abhijit ji will agree is we are told even in charak we are told don't get overly emotional am i right abhijit ji because masculine attitude if we only start crying and you know oh my god life is so unfair then what will we do cannot do anything no meaning the self indulgence so therefore we walk on this path for anubhava still finally we have we become established in a state of brahman consciousness or we get established in a state of universal or higher or reality or god consciousness and when i say god here we really have to bring god from the popular version of god to the god which is the universal truth now us and the universal truth 
the vibrations of nature, of seasons, and you, everything is vibrating at the same time. Enough of like giving away our gods to stories. No, my particular god wears golden colored Indian clothes. And my god, you know, he wears white robes. And my god, you know, is the son of this. And my god is the daughter of Saraswati. This is no meaning. These are our ways of loving gods. Because Shankara again in Vivek Chudamani says, what is manifest, what we can see, so the manifest God, that is also God. That our senses can see, it is all God. And what my senses and mind cannot reach, the transcendental consciousness, that is also God. So there are two ways of knowing God. One is called Saguna, one is called Nirguna. Saguna means with qualities. So we can see, you know, my God wears beautiful bindi and she's, where she's holding a veena, she's Saraswati, um, Lakshmi, you know, money is flowing through her hands. Um, he is, uh, you know, the father in heaven, son. This is my Saguna God. I, I am adoring my God through my senses. So I have given him a beautiful face. I have given him a beautiful heart. I have given him uh, her a beautiful veena. I have given, I have placed her on a lotus. And Shankara says, of course, you can love God like this also. And here we will love them through our heart. And this is called bhakti. Through the path of bhakti yoga. Through devotion. And the other God, which is the self, Atman, the transcendental reality, the reality beyond the known reality, that God which we cannot know through our ordinary senses and mind but only through our purified self, that God is called Nirguna or without any of those 20 qualities you are studying. And that God can only be known through Jnana Yoga or knowledge. You follow? So Shankara is not saying this God is better than that God. See, Vedanta is very inclusive. In fact, Shankara was a big, big devotee of Goddess Durga, Kali. And has written such beautiful songs of worship of the Hindu gods. So some people say, oh, oh, he believes in Kali. He's a Kali worshipper. He sees the transcendental in the eminent. And he sees, you are following? He sees the absolute in what you can see in front of you. And then he loves it because it represents the absolute. So he never got bound. Whereas what, what ordinary Hindu will do? I believe in Kali. You believe in Ganesha? Oh, okay, then we are not talking. <laughs> that is the Baddha Jiva's way of religion. But the Nitya Mukta, like Shankara said, the scholar, he said, God is everywhere. So therefore, your and my God, it doesn't matter the way you worship the absolute, imminent and absolute, relative and absolute. And therefore, Bhakti Yoga and Gyan Yoga. And what is Karma Yoga? Karma Yoga you need in both. Karma Yoga is a kind of a specialized actions. So therefore they are all connected. So Vivek Chudamani, we are still on the first shloka. And I will just read it once more to close this satsang. In fact, to make my point about uh, what we can see and what we cannot see, I might like to go back to the first shloka itself, where uh, Shankara says, Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta Gocharam tamag, tamagocharam govindam paramanandam sadgurum pranato asmiham. So, pranato asmiham means pranato asmi. I salute. I salute to who? Shankara is saying, I salute in the first verse. I salute to who? And he says, Govinda. Who is Govinda? Govinda is also the name of Krishna. Govinda is also the name of his own personal Acharya. His personal teacher's name was um, um, Acharya Govinda Pad. 
and the Sacharya Govinda Path was on uh, had a Gurukul on the banks of River Narmada, which is uh, uh, which is not in the state where Shankara was from Kerala. So he walked very far to the banks of River Narmada to study in the Gurukul of his Acharya. So for those of you who are commuting, this is very good auspicious news to Vedika. So when you are a Mumukshu, you do not complain about commute, you do it. And then he says, who is, what is this Govinda's nature? So he says, Paramanandam, supreme bliss. So I am worshipping that Guru, which could also represent the Self and God. I, he, his nature is supreme bliss. Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta Gochara means, and that supreme bliss, how will it be realized? Through Sarva Vedanta Siddhantas, through the principles, all the principles of Vedanta, they become Gocharam or they become known to us. Suddenly we see those principles and see and feel and hear and know, like through our internal senses, the supreme bliss. But, Tama Agocharam, but through these physical eyes, you cannot see. Through these physical ears, you cannot hear. So that means I am bowing to that Sadguru, that supreme bliss, that absolute God who is the abode and fulfillment of supreme bliss, who reveals himself within me through the principles of Vedanta. Though when I try to find it here and there in the world, I cannot find. So, this is the first. And to complete this first shloka, Jantu nama narjanma durlab mataha Pumstvam tato viprata Tasmad vaidik dharma marg parata Vidvatvam asmat param This uh, vaidik dharma not only we learn it, but we understand it with Vatvam. Atmanatmana vechanam means we discriminate constantly so that we can have Swanubhava experience. Brahmatmana samsthitihi and become established in this higher or immortal consciousness within the self all the time. Muktirno shatakoti janmasu kritaihi punyarvina labhyate. But this kind of unique, beautiful liberation, this whole path, cannot be obtained without meritorious karma or good deeds in several lifetimes and uh, uh, of intelligent living. And for some ordinary people, they will become scared. Oh, it will take several lifetimes and of intelligent living. But here I am very much rather attached to my non-intelligent, mm -hmm. self-indulgent, emotional <clears throat> living. And um, it will take several lifetimes, not this one lifetime. I don't have the time for all of that. But for some of the mumukshus amongst us, and you never know if you're a mumukshu, but if this excites you, you will say, only just a few lifetimes of intelligent living. Okay, I begin now. And, uh, uh, and soon you will learn that time is just a concept, you see, and it can happen in the next moment. So there is no such thing, but intelligent living, Vive living with Viveka, and that is what Ayurveda talks about. In fact, its definition itself is the discrimination <coughs> between Hita and Ahita, so that you can have a life of Sukha and Hita. Beneficial life and a happy life is the foundation of health and it can be had only through viveka or discrimination. So therefore let us put our discrimination hats on and <coughs> let us acknowledge that we are mumukshus and let us begin the internal discrimination. So with this we end. Jema, thank you. Uh,